Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 36 of Daffy's Roundtable. I'm super, super, super excited for this episode. One niche that I'm a really big fan of in this hobby is caudates. I keep a few species myself, but I still consider myself a beginner, and I have tons of questions. And while we do have some really reliable resources putting out information on these species, like Amphibicast, for example, nothing beats having a conversation with an experienced breeder in person. So for today's episode, my guest is Josiah from Serpents and Salamanders. And we're going to talk all about his experiences raising and breeding these incredible animals. But before we do that, I want to give a huge thank you to Exoterra for making this episode possible. Exoterra makes quality products for our pet reptiles to make them feel at home. Okay, without further ado, everybody, please help me welcome Josiah of Serpents and Salamanders. Hello. Hey. How are you today? Great. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on. I'm very, very excited to do this, and I'm very excited to talk um, caudates, new oh, salamanders. Um, but before we get to all that, can you let me know, uh, first of all, like the story of serpents and salamanders? Uh, I believe it's you and your brother yeah. that are doing it. Yeah, so sort of like how you guys originally got into keeping herps and then um, how serpents and salamanders came to be. Sure. Yeah, so I think like a lot of us in the hobby, you know, there were some things early on in our lives that were very impactful. So my brother and I actually uh, were fortunate enough to grow up overseas uh, in West Africa. Uh, my parents were missionaries uh, in the country of Guinea. So from the time I was three years old to about 13, uh, that's, that's where I was at. So, you know, you can imagine the kind of animals, you know, we kind of saw on a daily basis and that I think really fostered an early, um, just, you know, super interest in the, those kind of animals, just seeing them every day, um, trying to keep them whenever we could. Um, I remember, you know, there's a lot of mosquitoes in West Africa, so we have mosquito nets over our beds and we would go out and we would catch chameleons and we would put them on our mosquito nets, you know, thinking that they were going to keep the, keep all the mosquitoes away. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we were introduced to a lot of cool animals really early on. Um, and of course, when you're kids, uh, you don't really know a whole lot about what goes into um, keeping these animals uh, as, you know, in ways that are best for them. So fortunately, you know, there was a lot of learning experiences. Um, but I think those those early um, those early introductions to all those creatures um, really fostered that early interest. Um, and then when we came back to the States, I also had some neat opportunities um, in high school um, to really study some cool animals. Um, the high school I went to, there was um, a biology teacher there that taught some really cool classes that um, kind of got, got us out into, into the woods, into the wetlands, um, you know, looking at a lot of the animals that, um, you know, you don't see on a normal basis. So in our zoology class, we actually went out and studied um, vernal pools so we were going out in the spring, you know, send traps for the salamanders, you know, learn about all these things that I had never seen or heard about, you know, anywhere else. So, you know, I would say one that biology teacher was probably really instrumental um, in keeping that interest alive and well, I would say. Um, and my brother, you know, we went to the same high school. So I would say that was probably someone that was instrumental in, um, in his uh, development as well. Um, so yeah, that kind of gets us up to high school. And then of course you're probably wondering, <clears throat> you know, there's not a lot of, at least for me, there's not a lot of salamanders in West Africa. So, you know, where did that, where did that first, you know, kind of come up? Um, and honestly, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, you know, we did study them in high school, you know, looking at the vernal pools. Um, but honestly, I, I just, I think one, a memory that I have is just remember seeing a paddle tailed newt in a pet shop. Um, I think I was would have been in high school at the time, and I just remember being so enamored with it. And, you know, that kind of caused me to, I think that's one of the first newts that I had. You know, I went out and picked one up and, you know, didn't know anything about it, but I was just, I uh, thought it was the coolest thing ever. And that's probably, I would say, <clears throat> kind of where I picked that up. Um, and going into high school, um, sorry, going into college then, I studied zoo and wildlife biology. Um, really wanted to kind of continue that education there. Um, so did some some field some field work, kind of studying some salamander habitat uh, in the area that I was at in Ohio. Um, so just kind of, yeah, continued that whole path working with salamanders. Um, 
at that at that point too, I was starting to keep a little bit more. Um, I had my paddle tailed newt. Uh, started keeping some axolotls. Um, back then too, you could find a little bit more variety um, at the reptile shows. So I started getting some different fire belly newts. Um, <clears throat> and then um, I think there's that was probably that was probably about about, about it at the time, um, at least in college. So fast forward, I guess a little bit. Um, ended up kind of getting it a degree in the zoo and wild zoo and wildlife biology. Did an internship um, with the U.S. Uh, fisheries up on um, Lake Erie. Um, awesome. I don't know if I mentioned I'm from Ohio, but uh, so with the division of fisheries up there, and turned out like turns out I get really seasick. So I was like, oh, I don't really want to do this. Yeah. So fair, fair. <laughs> and um, I looked at kind of the zoo path a little bit. You know the the degree that I got, you know, did offer us some coursework up at the Cleveland Zoo. But at that time, um, I didn't really want to work for whatever reason. I didn't really feel like I wanted to work at an institution like of that nature. I kind of just wanted to like go more the hobbyist route. Um, so I ended up getting a job at a local research lab. And that, that's where I'm still working at today, but um, kind of kept going with the hobby. And, you know, once you get out of school, and you're making a little bit of money, you can put a little bit more into your hobby. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I would say probably where it started getting for me and my brother was we started amassing, you know, these collections and we're like, we enjoy this a lot, but it's not really sustainable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Because when you start getting into the proper care of, you know, numerous animals, um, it gets expensive. It, it gets expensive. 100%. So we were like, all right, we got to do something. Um, so we started looking at vending at the local Columbus reptile show and um, we kind of got our foot, our door, the, our foot in the door there and started doing that once a month. Um, and we're like, well, you know what, we probably should make this official. So that's when we decided, you know, we kind of brainstormed a little bit what that would look like. And we're like, well, I really like the, the caudate side of things. And, you know, he ended up, you know, liking the reptiles. So, Serpent Salmon just kind of seemed like a catchy name. <laughs> 100%. No, it's awesome. Yeah. It's, so, it, it flows off the tongue and it tells you exactly what you guys exactly, are working with. Yeah. So and, perfect. you know, that's yeah. not all we keep. You know, I've kept some frogs and toads here and there. And my brother, you know, he keeps uh, some varanids, um, a few other things. But for the most part, yes, it definitely describes, you know, our two areas of interest. And, um, you know, I had a friend design a logo for us. And, um, yeah, we've kind of just been kind of growing it ever since. You know, we're still, I would say, hobbyists first. Um, but, you know, we do have to support it. So that's kind of where we've gone with the business, I guess, so to speak. That so is that's, very, very that's cool. very, you know, streamlined, you know, very, in a nutshell, kind of how we came to where we're at right now, I would say. Yeah, it's awesome. It's always it's always a very long story. So yeah, um, but no, that that's a very very cool story. I, I have like a hundred follow ups to that, but I'll only go for a few. Sure. Of them. Uh, first of all, um, I also had a chance to study vernal pools. Uh, I was actually doing it in the Adirondacks, but it was only a field course, so mm -hmm. it was only a couple of weeks. But um, what species were you uh, were you finding in the vernal pools? First of all, yeah. So in Ohio, we have uh, the ones we found were spotted salamanders and Jefferson salamanders. Um, there was also a locality that was supposed to have tiger salamanders, but we, when we set the traps, we didn't find any. It was mostly just the Jeffersons and Spotteds. Awesome. Okay. And then you you said you're still working in the research lab? Yeah. I, I don't know if, if, uh, if I'm allowed to ask, but if you, if you don't mind, I mean, what, what are you guys? You can uh, ask. So yeah. it's, uh, I work for Charles River Laboratories. So we do at least my division. Charles River is a huge company with lots of different divisions, but we're the contract research side. And we do non-clinical or preclinical safety assessment. So our job is to make sure that the compounds that are we're testing for all these different companies are safe for the consumer. So we don't do efficacy or anything like that. It's just looking at safety. Um, and so then basically we do the tests. Um, we provide that data to the client and they submit it to the FDA and then they get approval to use their compounds. So... My specific department is developmental and reproductive toxicology. Um, so we're looking at, you know, I mean, I guess it kind of says the name, but anything that would, you know, affect reproduction, um, you know, fertility, um, even growth, you know, from, 
you know, for neonates up through, you know, the juvenile period, um, things that, you know, there's no clinical trials for because I don't think anyone in the right mind would sign up a newborn or a pregnant mother for a clinical trial, right? So, of course. Um, yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's something I've, you know, come very pa uh, passionate about um, and thankful that, you know, I kind of done that for the last 10 years or so. Awesome. That's that's a very, very cool job. Um, okay, so now to get into the uh, the caudates. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned already that you were kind of keeping the paddle tails and the um, a few of the fire bellies. Um, could you maybe give us a, a, a rundown of some of the species you're keeping? Yeah, so Currently. paddle tails is like kind of what got me into it, and that's where I started. Um, but yeah, I, like over the years, I've definitely added to that. Um, I think at last count, if you count just species, I'm at about 19. And if you add in subspecies, about 24, 25 maybe, I think is where it's at, um, depending on where you want to draw the line. Uh, yeah. So it uh, it keeps me busy. <laughs> for sure. It's, uh, for sure. it's a full-time job in itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I wonder where I find the time to do it all, but um, okay, you know, I still love it, so that helps. Yeah, you, you got to, or, or there's no, <laughs> there's like you said earlier, there's not much money in it, so it's it really is a labor of passion. And yeah, love. yeah, just gotta make sure it pays for itself. For sure. Uh, do you find people are usually drawn to your table uh, at ex expos more for like the wow factor? It's something they haven't seen, or is it usually just um, like? Newt and salamander people, Newt and salamander people that are just like, okay, um, I know where I'm going. I, I'm, I'm picking this up kind of thing. Yeah. So I would definitely say most people that come by the table, they really have no idea or seen anything like it before. So there's definitely that, wow, what is that factor? And that's probably, I think, one of the most enjoyable parts for me, I think, is talking to them, um, talking about people that haven't seen them before, kind of explaining what they are and the husbandry, you know, and, you know, uh, th I guess things of that nature and then over the course of time seeing people come back having done some research and like all right you know this is cool I've looked into it I've set up my tank it's cycled or I've created this habitat I'm ready to get one now like that that is really cool like that's one probably one of the best parts but I would say for the most part most people don't really know what they are when they first see them you know they're like oh is that a gecko is that a lizard yeah <laughs> is that I, aquatic I hear lizard? That, that's um, the one I hear lizard fish very frequently. Lizard fish. Yeah. Yeah. You name it. We, yeah. yeah. We get it all. And, you know, sometimes it gets a little old, you know, saying the same thing over and over again. But, you know, I understand that not everyone has my background. You know what I mean? Like, sure. some people, they're just, you know, they saw the ad for it and they're like, oh, that sounds cool. Reptiles. Let's go see. You yeah, know, because it's a reptile yeah. show. You know, it's mostly snakes and, you know, reptiles. So, like, some people don't even know what an amphibian is. Definitely so, having those conversations and, yeah we're we're big on the education side of things just just kind of yeah seeing people learn about a new a new animal is really cool i 100 percent agree um so and, and with that being said why do you think that they're not as popular as pets as some of the other reptiles like wild pythons aggressive geckos um, so i think there's probably a couple reasons for that right now a big one probably is just availability um, I've only, I've only vended at, vended, vend, I'm not sure what's, I've only vended at two, <laughs> two shows. We did one in Pittsburgh and then we do the one in Columbus, uh, pretty much every month. And we're pretty much the only table that ever has newts. And most people are like, oh, I haven't seen those in years. Yeah. Right. So availability is a big one. Um, but even when they were available, I think just a lot of people don't understand the husbandry. So the people that did keep them, they just didn't do well and they probably perished. Because a lot of people will come by and like, oh, that's cool. It's swimming in water. Can I keep that with my neon tetras? And the answer is no, you can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? So, unfortunately, prior to 2016, these things were coming in, uh, particularly the fire belly newts, in huge numbers. Like, you could buy three for 10 bucks. Like, no. So, people were just picking them up, throwing them in their fish tank. And then, you know, while they are hardy, you know, they can only stand so much when they don't have the proper conditions, proper husbandry. So, there's probably mass mortality. And usually if someone is not having success with something, they're not likely to go out and get it again, uh, at least in my experience. So I think those are probably, yeah, a lot of people just don't understand the husbandry and the care requirements. And then recently, more recently is the availability. Like they're just, it's not something you're gonna see every day. You know, like they're not at the big box stores. Um, you, you either have to find one online, pay a fortune in shipping to get one to come to your door or stumble across one at a reptile show. It's essentially 
you know how you're going to find them right now yeah and just to put things into perspective for people you just said three for ten dollars um i'm assuming that's usd but just you know yes yeah sorry ignoring 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 conversions and everything um I recently picked up a group of captive bred ones. And like you said, I had to get them shipped from the other side of the country and they were $90 each. So from three to 10, and, and again, that's Canadian, but like, you know, you guys do yeah, the conversions, like get, but yeah, that's a, it's sub- a substantial difference, right? Substantial difference. Exactly. It's, it's crazy. And I believe uh, all the ones that were coming in before were all wild caught as well. Yeah. All wild caught. So, and I think part of the mindset is too, people come to my table and they'll see a fire belly newt and like, Oh, it's $50. I used to get those for, three bucks. Like, I'm not going to do that. So it's, yeah. it's a mindset thing too. People have a hard time transitioning from, you know, seeing something really cheap. And then all of a sudden this price, you know, it's like 10 times as much, but you know, they are captive bred. There's a lot of time and effort and money that goes into raising them. So, you know, people just don't always take that into account. hundred percent. Um, okay. And then, so there's, Different types. So, so there's newts and there's salamanders, but right. there's also like semi-aquatic newts and fully aquatic newts. And could you maybe break down a little bit the differences between all of them? Right. So the difference between newts and salamanders, um, essentially, they're they're the same thing. Um, the way I kind of explain it to people is all all it's kind of like frogs and toads, right? So all all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. So right. all newts are salamanders, but not all salamanders are newts. Newts is kind of like a subdivision of salamanders that is kind of characterized in a certain way. Um, the thing with how scientists characterize things, like there's never something that fits in the box 100%. So, you know, typically the newts, you know, they might say they have like, uh, like warty, warty, warty dry skin, you know, um, uh, I guess how else would they characterize them? Uh, basically they have like a terrestrial F phase and the aqu- adults are aquatic, whereas the salamanders are, have the uh, terrestrial adult phase. But like, there's so many, um, variations among that, that like, it's not, doesn't describe everything. It's not one um, fits all. Yeah. There's not one, there, yeah, there's not one shoe fits all, I guess. Um, I would say the easiest way to know which animals are considered newts are pretty much everything in the family salamander day are considered newts except for I think salamandra, the fire salamanders are in there as well. Um, that's as, at least scientifically speaking, those are, that's primarily what we would consider nudes. Um, does that make sense? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I'm, I'm not a taxonomist, you know, I'm a hobbyist, so I've kind of picked it up as I go. So I don't know if I always explain things 100% uh, correctly, but that is, that is my understanding based on kind of what I picked up through reading and research over the years. Awesome. Okay. So now that we have that general idea in our head, um, one one thing that's a common, commonly talked about thing and a common problem, I guess, more in the frog world is chytrid. Yes. Um, and there is an, a similar thing in the Newton Salamander world called uh, BSAL or BSAL or however. BSAL, yeah. Else. Yeah. Um, are you ever worried about it? And I mean, I guess, what's your general opinion on BSAL? So, I mean, BSAL is a problem. Um, thankfully it hasn't been detected in captive populations in the United States, uh, to date that I'm aware of. Um, but it right now, so B cell is native to somewhere in Asia and through whatever, however means, you know, the, the pet trade was vilified, but vilified, but there's a lot of ways, you know, pathogens can spread. Um, but it is essentially wreaking havoc on fire salamander populations in Europe. Um, it, yeah, it's a nasty, it's a nasty fungus. Um, basically, so it's sal- the the species of the fungus is it's called salamander vorans, and basically it's like it means salamander eater. So essentially, what it does is it eats the salamander's skin, kind of causing them to kind of break out in, uh, in ulcers. And salamanders breathe it, breathe through their skin, absorb moisture through their skin, so it kind of disrupts that. And then it's based based on whatever it sounds like. Typically, they die from some sort of secondary infection as well. And fire salamanders, uh, from what I've read, seem to be the species that are most affected by it. Um, but as I mentioned, it hasn't been detected in the United States. And I mentioned, I think I dropped the date 2016 a little bit ago. But um, when sal- this, the B sal was first kind of getting picked up, um, kind of raised a lot of alarms because of the impact that the chytrid 
fungus it had on the frogs. So 2016, U.S. Fish and Wildlife passed this huge import ban, um, basically saying you can't import any more newts and salamanders into the United States. Um, so this has had, as far as I can tell, good impact, at least as far as the importation side of things. Now, the, the thing about the ban what raised a lot of alarm among hobbyists, at least in the United States, was that there was also, an inter they Im implemented an interstate ban as well, uh, which basically would make it uh, impossible, you know, to, to move from to move, to move animals for states. So you could live, you know, a mile away from somebody, and if they're on the other side of the state, you know, if you took something to them, you know, it'd be a felony, essentially. So, um, thankfully, USARC, um, they kind of took it to court and they determined and they basically won the case because the Fish and Wildlife was interpreting the Lacey Act incorrectly um, because it basically is should have just impacted the continental United States, things coming into it. They couldn't uh, regulate things going in between the states. Um, so I think in discussions I had with, I think most serious hobby, hobbyists were, you know, we definitely felt the import ban was a good thing uh, because, you know, it's unregulated. There's a lot of animals coming in. Um, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't conducive to creating, I guess, a healthy captive breeding population here because the these captive animals that came in, they were available so cheap that, you know, if you killed 50 of them, you could just go get 50 more for really cheap. Nobody um, wanted to captive breed them. Right. So the good thing is, with that ban in place, it has really put an impetus on captive breeding. So we're seeing a lot more of that. Um, yeah. And you don't have, you know, wild populations being negatively impacted by just being mass imported um, into, into, into different countries. And I, I believe Canada has uh, a similar import ban, right? We do. And there's um, barely any species that we're already in right. <laughs> prior to the import ban. And so we, so we can uh, import some species, but... Uh, anything that's like high risk for B cell or anything like that is uh, we can't bring it in anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's good. Like, so yeah, I mean, we, we welcome some regulation there. The problem I think at least with the U S ban is like, there's pretty much no way to get anything in. Like it would have been nice to, you know, if you could provide paperwork, you know, with things being tested, um, you know, have, yeah, know, if you're doing right. or something sign off on, like, I feel like there's ways to get things in to make sure you're not, you know, spreading bee sow um, and unfortunately it doesn't look like those avenues are available for us here so what we have is what we have um the weird thing is that you know with a lot of things you know that come from the government it was kind of uh like the list that they banned didn't really make sense i mean they pretty much just tried to ban everything but it looked like they just copied and pasted something from wikipedia so there are species on there that didn't exist like we're, we're taxonomically valid or things like that. So there are technically species you can't import that aren't on the list. Um, there are things that are more rare that are, aren't necessarily readily available, but kind of a fidget, kind of defeats the purpose of the ban because, you know, all those species could potentially still be vectors. But I mean, that's probably a discussion for another time. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, it's super interesting. Um, because we, we hear a lot about it over here, but I, again, like you mentioned, I don't think we've ever had a case um, in Canada either. So it's 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 a lot of, in the community, it's a lot of like, do we believe what, like, do, obviously it's a, it's, it's, it's a real thing, but do we believe it's as serious as they make it seem? Or is it more of a, you know, some, some like, some people playing playing their part so they can benefit? I, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's always an interesting question. It is, and... Interesting. Some of the things that I've read too is so the thing about Europe is you know at least where the fire salamanders are, it's a little bit cooler climate than the United States, generally speaking. Um, and the, at least for the, the B sow, um, they've done they've done tests, and I think it's seventy seven degrees Fahrenheit, which would be like twenty twenty something Celsius. Yeah, it's just twenty twenty one. Uh, I think. I think it's, it's a little twenty five. I think is what I read. You said 77? 77. I think it's 25. And, um, yeah, it's 25. Correct. So, <laughs> so you can, so for, if you treat the salamanders at that temperature for a few weeks, you can kill the, the bee sow. So that's one theory as to why with all the mass imports in the past that it hasn't, um, if it did come in, it hasn't taken off or had any impact because of the, the higher temperatures. 
And it also sounds like some of our native species are somewhat resistant to it as well, um, which which is a great thing because, you know, the United States has, a, I'm pretty sure it's the highest diversity of salamanders or caudates in the world, you know, especially around the, you know, the, the Smoky Mountain area. Like there's tons, tons of diversity there. So, I mean, the, the rush was, you know, they didn't know it was here yet. So they're just like, all right, we'll do something. And, you know, this is unfortunately... While there are benefits, you know, there are, there, you know, things that aren't as much fun to deal with as well, but. That temperature point is, is actually a great segue to sort of getting into the care and yeah. the husbandry of the animals. So obviously disclaimer and putting it out there before we get into this part, every species is different. Right. Like research, everything differs, but yep. um, in general, uh, what, what, like sort of what temperatures are you keeping? Um, are you keeping your animals at? And are you, um, do you, I guess it wouldn't be heating for, for these animals, but do you cool the room or do you cool every aquarium individually or sort of how do you do that? Right. So, yeah. So the main thing with most caudates that are in the pet trade is they're going to need it cooler than mm -hmm. most species that people are probably used to working with. Most people, they think heat source when they're keeping some sort of herp like that. Yeah. Um, and there are some species that actually do need a little warmer, like some of the crocodile newts, um, uh, I think the Shanjing, you know, they'll, they'll do fine up to like 75, probably even close to 80 degrees. Like they come from some pretty warm, humid areas. Um, but obviously that's not something that's going to be readily available for most people. Um, I would say most, most species that are available in the pet trade, you want to shoot for probably below 70 degrees, um, if not colder, um, to ensure that you're not impacting their health over, you know, the course of their lifetime negatively. Um, so I can actually keep mine in, I have a garage um, that is exposed, it's not, it's not insulated entirely, but so it does cool down in the winter. Um, so it gets down to about 55, I think is what I measured it last year. Um, in the summer, it gets about 70 degrees, maybe 72. So that's, that's kind of the range that I keep my animals at. Um, if I need things, um, a little bit warmer. Um, I'll try and keep them in another room, uh, especially in the winter. Some of my juvenile terrestrial species don't, don't like it quite as cold. So I pull them out and put them in a little bit warmer room, but generally speaking about 55 is what I'm getting my animals down to, to kind of stimulate, uh, stimulate them to breed. That's awesome. That's actually one of my questions and I just had to look it up real quick. So that's actually 12 degrees Celsius. Um, so once you're bringing them down to this temperature, First of all, how uh, I guess it's it's happening naturally because it's in your garage. Yep. So yeah, I, I rely play. on the seasons. It's really nice. I don't have to, you know, put them in. I know a lot of people will put them in a fridge or a wine cooler during I'm, the winter months. Um, okay. But thankfully, yeah, I just let the seasons do the work, and uh, it's worked out great for me so far. So, you know, I, ne I can't necessarily claim I've manipulated anything one way or another to, to make it successful. It's just the setup of my room really is conducive to keeping caudates. Yeah, I know. That's awesome. How long does it usually stay at around? I, I know there's a, probably like a drop and a rise, but like generally how long does it stay at around 12 degrees for or 15? Um, I would <sighs> say let's, I mean, it's cooling off right now. It's in the mid sixties and usually probably by December, it's pretty much in the fifties until maybe February, March when it starts coming out of that. I used to do a real good job about tracking all this in a journal when I first started, <laughs> but um, once you get the hang of things, you I stop kind of, keeping yeah, as much that track. Yeah, I, you know, I realized that that information is really beneficial to people that haven't necessarily gone through the cycle cycle before. But mm -hmm. yeah, with the with the the seasons taking care of pretty much everything for me, I I kind of stopped keeping track of some of that stuff. Um, but yeah, I would say probably three to four months out of the year, it's are probably. 50 55 degrees or so um and then you know 60 ish on either side of that and then the apex you know a low 70s during the summer are you feeding them um in those three to four months yeah i feed everything year round i don't have anything that i think i've cooled off enough um where they went off feed i guess one exception would be my paddle tails i haven't i have a pair of paddle tails that are wild caught from years ago and I've done a little bit of experimentation with them. They're notoriously difficult to breed in captivity. Um, only I only know a handful of people that have pulled it off, and it seems to kind of be more of a fluke than this thing or that thing that has contributed to it. 
Uh, so I've, I've got them down. Like I put them like I have a room upstairs that is, you know, completely exposed to the elements. And like, I had like an inch ice on their tank for a winter, you know, I was, and they definitely did not eat during that period. But, um, generally speaking, yeah, I'm not doing that. I only tried that one year cause it, it wasn't successful. And I, I was a little worried. It was, no, it was not successful. Uh, and I wasn't sure, you know, how stressful it'd be on the animals as well too. So I haven't tried it since. And I mean, either way I haven't had success. So still, still thinking about ways that can, um, I guess, manipulate their parameters for breeding in the future. But I would say, yeah, everything else I have, you know, I don't think it's gotten cold enough where they've gone off feed, which is really nice. So I'm pretty much feeding through the winter. Um, probably not as regularly as I would during the summer. Their, their metabolism, I don't think are quite as, quite as fast yeah. um, with the colder temperatures, but everything still eats for me during the, during the, the winter. So, so let me ask you this, then how often sure. are you generally feeding uh, in summer? And then like, I, I know it's like, kind of things you have to gauge but yeah is it like a daily feeding are you feeding every other day or so it depends on the species and also the age of the animals Juven yes. juveniles i'm feeding probably almost every day uh depending on what i fed them um and it can be yeah it can be labor intensive adults probably maybe once a week of like a big feeding during the winter maybe two or three times during the week during the summer um but give or give or take i would have to say and each species is a little bit different. Um, some of my adults I might feed a little more often, maybe some of the smaller species, like I have some some palmate newts, um, you know, they're small European species. I probably feed them a little bit more, a little bit more often, um, if I had to guess. Um, I mean, and newts, like, they'll beg for food, you know. Yes, they <laughs> like, will. <laughs> they're, they're bottomless pits, so, um, you know, one thing that... I don't typically worry about because I don't feed things that are really fatty. Um, I know so, some big salamanders, you know, people start feeding pinkies too, and they can, you know, develop obesity problems, but um, I don't feed anything that I, I mostly focus on worms. You know, I do a lot of uh, composting. So I have earthworms that I feed and then, um, you know, I'll collect night crawlers or order night crawlers in bulk online. Um, is, so those are probably the, the primary foods that I'm feeding. Um, and then also black worms, you know, are an easy food source. Um, but I try and focus those on, uh, larval and larval or small juveniles because, uh, they're costly <laughs> and, um, you know, obviously it takes a lot more black worms to feed an adult than it does, uh, a smaller juvenile. So they go farther that way as well. For sure. Um, so there's, there's also, while we're on the topic of feeding, there's also like the, the big debate of, um, and I, and I've done this, I, I, I still do this to this day. And so it's, it's kind of like, you know, a question of whether I should continue to do it or, <laughs> or stop. But a lot of people tend to worry about feeding their, um, their caudates brine shrimp because it's a saltwater animal that's being fed to a freshwater animal. Mm -hmm. So they're opting to do like microworms and vinegar eels and stuff like that instead. Do you feed brine shrimp? Do you worry about it? Um, and what else are you feeding if not the brine shrimp to the really? So I do still use some brine shrimp. Okay. Um, so I'm so, good. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I don't like it and I get them off it as fast as I can. Okay. Um, and you, typically I don't have any issues as long as you keep up with it, with, um, with like the water changes or siphoning out the dead ones as soon as possible. Um, I'm trying to get more towards uh, culturing Daphne. I do culture a lot of Daphne. The problem is, um, new newborn larvae are pretty small, and even some of the the regular Daphnia species, they're a little too big for them. So, last year, I for the first time, I started culturing Moina. I think that's how you say it. it's a lot smaller species of Daphnia. Yeah. So I'm really I'm really trying to go that route. It's just the the brine shrimp are very convenient. You know, you can get a culture going in less than 24 hours. Um, whereas you know Daphnia, you know their the cultures can be susceptible to crashing boom booms and bust cycles. So. Um, I haven't quite got it down to a science, <laughs> so the, the brine shrimp are definitely slow backup, um, and I'm not a fan of them at all, but um, I do recognize their utility. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, like I said, I try and get off of them as soon as possible. Like if I if I can get those smallest larvae off, you know, like less than a week, I usually I'm trying to get them off of, off those things, and then get them right onto like small chop black worms or uh, other 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 small. Uh, organisms um i culture white worms so like you can feed them really small white worms um 
I haven't really got into the Grindle worms or eel worms or anything like that, but I usually yeah. try to get them on the block worms as soon as I can. Yeah, I I, I use um so I, I still do use the brine shrimp as well because like you said, convenient and it's uh, very convenient. It's it's easy and and you know what I I, I like seeing the red bellies because then I actually know that they're they've eaten. That's that's another thing. Um, but more of a staple now. I'm trying to use like micro worms and finnard eels. The problem with them is um. Or, or from what I'm hearing is that they don't have much nutritional value because they're pretty much eating starch and the vinegar eels are pretty much eating like uh, gotcha. apples or something. So <laughs> it's always an interesting like, um, um, will I be losing more larva because of the nutri nutritional value of microworms or or is the, I was just saying like, um, uh, just I, I, we broke up at some point. So we're back yeah. here now. Um, so uh, I was just saying like, I feed a lot of microworms and vinegar eels, but apparently the they're not as nutritious as some of the other foods because uh, the microworms are pretty much just eating starch and the vinegar gotcha. eels are pretty much just eating apples. Um, so it's it's always an interesting question of you know what's the best feeder for for the larva, especially at such a uh, maybe not sensitive but like you know a more sensitive stage. Yeah, and the nice thing too about the brine shrimp is they help with some of that coloration. I've noticed. Um, yeah. I've never, I've never raised anything. I've never used the, the vinegar eels or anything like that, so I can't really comment on if that has any impact. But I do notice uh, you get some bright, some brighter orange bellies when you use the, when you start off with the brine shrimp, which which is nice. You know, we like to see that that natural coloration that you know the wild animals have. It, de it definitely helps, uh, at least you know from what I've noticed. But yeah, I'd not like I. I, I wish I didn't have to use them. Uh, I'm really trying not to. The problem with Daphne is you need a lot of space to, at least when you're dealing with the amount of young that I'm trying to raise, you need a lot of space to be able to raise that money, Daphne. And um, <laughs> it can be tough sometimes. You definitely can. Culturing the feeders is just as hard as raising the species you're breeding. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. The news, they need that small live food to start off with. And that's that's probably one of the hardest parts, yeah. Yeah. And I know this is like species dependent again, but how, or like generally, how soon are you getting them off live and onto like pellets and other things? Uh, ooh, that is a good question. So honestly, I don't use a lot of pellets. Okay. Um, I prefer live food. Uh, there, yeah. there are some, there are some pretty good pellets, I would say. I mean, I do, I do use some of the, I think it's range in salmon pellets. I use some of those for some of my adults. Um, but generally speaking, um, I, I try to introduce, once my larvae are probably starting to look, starting to develop a little bit of the adult coloration, I'll probably start introducing some of the frozen brine shrimp and frozen uh, frozen bloodworms. That's probably where I would start. Um, yeah. And pellets, usually not not until they're quite a bit bigger, because I, I only order one side of the pellets. I don't feel like ordering the smaller ones. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. But um, I most of the species, I haven't had too much trouble getting them onto them once they're older, like they're, they're, they're greedy little things. So if you just add some of the food they're used to in there with the pellets, usually they kind of pick one up by accident and they're they, just, yeah. they, they go to town. Now, one thing I have seen done that I do want to try is feeding pellets to terrestrial caudates. Um, <laughs> I have not accomplished it myself, but I've seen it done and that would be, that would make things really easy, but, uh, maybe next year. <laughs> yeah. So I've tried, um, I, I don't think they're considered like fire belly, uh, the sign no uh, orientalis i probably butchered that name the chinese firebelly or the yeah so fire I, belly. I think they're tried... a different genus now but i still say they're synops too okay yeah yeah i don't I, yeah no <laughs> i'm not 100 sure but uh i tried frozen bloodworms with them in the terrestrial stage and it they did they did take them. they did take them yeah 100 yeah, um but so what what decides or how speaking of terrestrial versus aquatic mm -hmm. um do you have species that you fully keep or like keep fully aquatic year round? Yeah. So, so I'm probably a little bit of a hip hypocrite on this because I do generally tell people like you try and keep animals, you know, to how they would be, how, how they live in the wild, right? Most, most closely match their natural history, but it is convenient to keep animals aquatic all year long, especially when you're selling them to general public. Um, having a people are, have a little bit bit more confidence i think dealing with an animal that's aquatic because aquariums are pretty popular as opposed to setting up um a terrarium where they have to you know make sure there's moisture gradient and proper 
uh, ventilation and things like right. that. So I do try, I do keep a lot of species aquatic, but if there's a species that I notice that it's, it seems just a little too stressful for them, um, I'll probably just try and keep them biphasic. So I, for at least for me, the classic example is the marbled newt. I keep a lot of those, raise a lot of those. Um, and a lot of people keep them aquatic 100% of the hundred percent of the time, but for whatever reason, I have had the most success and they seem to do best for me when I give them a terrestrial period, uh, terrestrial uh, as a juvenile into adulthood, and then I only move them aquatic to breed uh, when they're adults. And then when they're done breeding, I move them back on land. Um, other than that, um, I generally keep, yeah, I think I keep most of my species aquatic, aside from the 100% terrestrial ones like uh, fire salamanders. Or I have some crocodile newts that are pretty hydrophobic. They're not, they're not huge fans of the water. Um, so I'm not going to force something if they're really not going to take to it and do well in it. But, uh, I have, I have well water. So like, I'm, I don't have a water bill. Um, so <laughs> keep, keep things aquatic. <laughs> Definitely really works well for me. Awesome. If we could touch actually on that marble newt process for a minute, yeah. that, that would be awesome. So, so you, uh, the larva stage is, is aquatic and then you mm -hmm. move them like they have the terrestrial F stage, I guess. Yep. And then you move them, um, aquatic for breeding. Yes. So is it like, do you have them terrestrially for a few months and then aquatic for a few months and then move them back terrestrially? Is it two different setups or do you have sort of like a paludarium kind of thing going on? Or like, uh, if, yeah, if you could just describe their setup. for Sure. Me, so awesome. it's actually pretty, it's two set, two separate setups. I don't right. do a lot of paludarium style mm -hmm. tanks. Um, most of my stuff is very utilitarian just because with the amount of animals I have, uh, I see a lot of really cool videos on Instagram or YouTube of people just creating these insane enclosures. And I would love to do that um, at some point, but... Um, it makes breeding harder. <laughs> it does, yes. Yeah. You know, you want to be able to keep a close eye on the animals. Um, you know, if, if you're having babies in a huge, densely planted, plant, planted tank, you know, it's hard to get them out. Um, so what I, what I do is I keep the adults. It's a sterilite tub, you know, real sexy. <laughs> and... <laughs> Just forest floor substrate with some plants, cork bark, water dish, <clears throat> and I keep them keep them on that for pretty much from juvenile till about they're two years old is about when they breed normally. Two years old, um, okay. Approximately, I mean, it really depends on how big they are, um, but with proper proper nutrition, you know, and uh, they can reach breeding size and close. To, I've had males actually go aquatic and breed at a year, but. Um, I usually don't like to let them do that. I like to get them a little bit bigger up about two years old. Uh, so yeah, it's com it's two complete different setups. And then I'll just put them in um, an aquarium um, with some, uh, I use the egg strips. Um, uh, Triturus, the marble news, they like to fold the, uh, lay their eggs between folds of plant leaves. Okay. So I just cut a uh, plastic bag into strips and like anchor down with uh, some, like a pottery shard or like a stone and they just fold the, their eggs into the plastic and then you just pull that out and That's put the awesome. put the eggs into a breeding tank or depending on how long they were laying eggs for you could even just remove the adults and re, uh, rear the larva in the adult tank um, it just kind of depends on how long the breeding period was for that year because right. it is um, seasonally dependent it's, it's sometimes it goes a little bit longer sometimes a little bit shorter just depending on what the what the spring is like awesome and then you take the parents out and you move them back to a terrestrial yeah put them back terrestrial yep yeah, the usually they they're pretty good at giving indicators when they're done breeding, like the males. So I don't know if you're familiar with the as from with the marble news, but the males develop like this really awesome crest on their back yes. when they're breeding, um, and the females even get like you know they just look like they're more suited for water. You know their tails flatten out, uh, their you know their skin changes uh, to that more, um, I guess. Uh, brighter yeah more no, i guess i don't know if i would say brighter but like no. uh, smoother i guess is the word i was looking okay. for okay i don't right. know why that was evading me yeah. um but yeah once they're ready to come out of the water you know that crest reduced their tails kind of reduced their skin starts to change and i just pull them out and i'll set them back on their on their in their terrarium or i guess sterilite tub <laughs> yeah yeah uh that's funny that's actually how i'm keeping my newts uh right now as well while uh, but they're all I don't know how old they are, but uh, they're all my my uh, Chinese fire belly newts are definitely like below younger than a year, mm -hmm. and then my alpines are older, but they're still in that. You know, I just I've only had them for six months, so I'm still in that process of you stay in the tub till I figure out what I'm gonna do with you next. So they're, <laughs> next so they're terrestrial still. 
They're still terrestrial. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you know what subspecies they are? Um, if I showed you them, would you know? Probably not. But no. uh, I, could... <laughs> I actually um does uh, uh, hold on. Let me let me give you a name and see if that if that sounds familiar to you. So in the states, we only have I think one species really, the mm -hmm. Italian alpine newt. That's okay. Um, that's that's the one. That's the okay. one. Okay. Upon us. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Um, hold on. Hold on. Uh, oh, that's definitely not it. I'm trying to find. Um, oh, Ichthyo, Ichthyosaurus alpestris. Yeah. That's what, yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's the alpestris one. Alpestris yeah. upon us or upon a would be the full subspecies okay. if it's the Italian alpine. But yes. We don't. The one thing that's sorely lacking in the United States, and I'm guessing probably Canada too, is um, locality information. Like we don't yeah. have. There's hardly anything. I, I have one marbled newt that supposedly has locality information. I just haven't been able to get it from the person I got it from. Okay. But generally speaking, uh, we don't have any of that, and we just kind of go off their appearance and what they were sold to us as. Right. So. Yeah. So so at some point. Um, it could become more like the the reptile hobby where yeah, every every species has its own locale and everything. The do is there a difference visually between the lo I I mean there might be, but is there a difference visually between the lo locales? So the one that I only really know the difference between the Aponis and an Alpestris Alpestris. The, the Aponis is supposed to have more uh, speckling on its throat where the the nominate form is not supposed to, but I don't know if we have I've never seen uh, I don't think I've seen Alpestris, Alpestris in the States. So it's, it's possible they were here and like people just sell them as Alpines. So they could have, they, you know, they could have inter, you know, interbred at some point. Um, and, you know, without, with not getting any new blood in, you know, there aren't really isn't going to be any more new localities. So we're kind of just stuck with what we have. Um, yeah. I think the dark frog hobby and like some reptile hobby did a lot better job at uh, managing some of that than the caudate hobby did, but. Probably yeah. hobby's probably a lot smaller too. <clears throat> the dark frog hobby has it. Every, they know every single yeah. Locale and yeah, I know it's crazy. I wish but, we had that, but I think yeah. Uh, it it is know. also I feel maybe maybe not a newer hobby, but like you said, a smaller hobby. And it is, it yeah. I mean, hopefully they'll get they'll get that there as well. Yeah, I mean each hobby is a niche, but like <laughs> Cody's is like <laughs> a, a niche of a niche. The niche of a niche, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's funny. Um, <laughs> Uh, awesome. Okay. Um, so, so one, one more question on, on the cooling, um, mm -hmm. do you cool before you said they, they're usually like sexually mature at like around two years. Do you cool before they're sexually mature or, um, do you just keep them, keep them at normal temperatures for the first year or so until they're, they're at the right age? I pretty much cool every, I, everything that's in there pretty much gets the same we conditions. The you know, my right. thought is that, you know, juvenile is going to go through a cooling period in the wild too. Mm -hmm. Um, the only thing that I don't cool is if I think if that there's some species that aren't quite as juveniles that aren't quite as hardy at those lower temperatures. So, um, some of my warty newts, I've kept at more ambient temperatures, like in the mid sixties during the winter. Um, I have some louse warty newts that I am probably going to keep a little bit, uh, a little bit warmer this winter. They, they, they grow a little bit better between, um, 18 or it's like about 65 degrees, I think. So close to 19, maybe 19 degrees Celsius, awesome. something like that. Um, so they might do okay in those cooler temperatures, but um, I think they definitely wouldn't eat and they wouldn't thrive. And, you know, my best interest is to try and get some meat on their bones, you know, at that younger age and try and get them to grow, definitely. you know, because they're pretty small still. Definitely, yeah. So okay. Um, so earlier on, um, you mentioned uh, that it's it's kind of like aquariums, and you mentioned the word cycle. Yeah, uh, yeah. So as a fish keeper, I know what that is. Yes. Um, but for for those of you that don't, it's it's the nitrogen cycle that uh, I'm not gonna go into it now. But it's basically like um, what you do to to prepare an aquarium for a fish or a newt. Now we're finding out. So it does matter for them to to have a cycled aquarium as well. General, generally speaking, yes. Um, <laughs> they're not, I would, I would say they're not as some of the species, you know, like some pond newts, you know, they're going to breed in some, some waters in the wild that probably have a pretty high bio load, you know? Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, generally speaking, you want to make sure that water quality is as high as possible since they're living in that, you know, much smaller representation of their habitat than they would in the wild. So it's in our best interest to keep that as clean as possible and keeping up on, you know, I actually, I, honestly, I do not monitor um, any of those things anymore. Like I have a pretty regimented water change cycle. Um, How often that, do, you, do you do your water change? I, I'm, I'm changing water pretty much every week. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, yeah. More so for some species than others, like my Nerugus, Um I'm definitely changing, you know, which, my which Nerugus? Sorry. Um, I have Kaiseri and Crocatus. Awesome. Okay. Um, so yeah, those ones, you know, they're, they come from, you know, pretty clean streams, um, in mountain areas, um, uh, with like, uh, what's the word? Like a low germ load. Like there's not, there's not a lot of, uh, bio load in those streams, right? Okay. Uh, they're very clean mountain streams. So I really try and keep up on the water change on there. So yeah, every week, you know, I'm probably doing about 25% water change. Um, whereas some of my more pond new citrus, you know, there's, they're heavily planted, um, you know, I might let it go a little bit longer here or there, but generally speaking, I'm changing water every week. Um, yeah. And I, I do have a, a test kit, but I haven't used it in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I also have a test kit that I haven't used in a long time and I keep tons of fish. I think once you, once you, like you said, you have your regimen, once you get your, your, your grasp on things, you start yeah. to, need to use it a lot, a lot less. Yep. But I mean, I definitely recommend if someone's starting out, it's a, it's a very handy tool to have. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just making sure you, especially if you're cycling something from scratch. I mean, I haven't cycled anything from scratch in yeah. probably 10 years, but. <laughs> yeah, 100%. You know, grab you know, the cycle I've media and move it over. What's that? I grab the cycle media and move it over. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a huge time saver. Um, and yeah, I use almost entirely sponge filters as well. So it's all air driven and, you know, they're easy to clean. I'm guessing yeah. you probably use something similar in your tanks. Yeah, that was actually my next question. I have um, I have a canister filter on one of the axolotl tanks, mm -hmm. and then I have uh, sponge filters on everything else. But um, like uh, I have my Spanish rib newts in uh, 55 gallon, and I feel like having the sponge filter on just one side this kind of stops the like one side you feel like the surface is moving a lot more than the the other side. Mm -hmm. and you kind of feel the oil film going on inside. So do you do you use multiple sponge filters on one tank or uh i don't know if this question even makes sense but it, it depends on the size of the tank yeah, um yeah i guess that's my, true. um i use mostly well i guess i don't say mostly i have, I have 10 gallon 20 gallon and then 40 breeder is pretty much the range of tanks that i have excuse okay. me um so yeah some of the 40 breeders i probably have two probably two decent sized sponge filters in um, but the 10 glance, all the 10 gallons is going to be probably one just, you know, matter of space saving really. Yeah. And then, um, I do everything. I have this, I have the central blower, um, with, you know, the PVC, uh, which, you know, like a lot of, I got that idea from another fish keeper. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's my general setup. You know, it's like I said, it's very utilitarian. Um, I don't, I do all bare bottom, you know, I'm just trying to keep maintenance, um, as easy, let's just make it as easy as possible to be able to monitor things and clean, you know, when I need. And what do you put in for uh, them to lay eggs on? Are you using more like wood or more like plant kind of thing? So depend, depending on the species, um, the ones that lay on plants, I'm doing the egg strips mostly. Um, the the ones that I cut from plastic bags. Right, you, you already mentioned so that's, sorry, sorry. that's primarily what I'm using, to maybe varying degrees of thickness depending on the species. Um, but not everything lays on uh, plants like that. So like the Nerugus, they like to stick theirs uh, underneath rocks or to the side of rocks. So they stuck all theirs on the sponge filter and on I have a bunch of flat uh, stones in there and they stuck them all over those. Interesting. Um, I'm trying to think of anything. And then... I don't know if I have anything else that would lay differently. Some of the, well, I mean, and then not the salamandra haven't reproduced for me, but they actually, you know, they do like the live birth. Essentially they'll drop little baby larva into a water dish. That's but very cool. Ho hoping that happens next year. We'll see. They're not, I don't know if they're quite old enough. Yeah. That's very, very, very cool. Are you keeping any species terrestrially year round? I don't know if I already asked you this. I don't think I did. So the salamandra are the ones, they're, they're entirely terrestrial species. So I keep them hundred percent terrestrial. 
Um, I have a few crocodile newts that I keep pretty much 100%. Um, I have the Tylotetriton yang eye. Um, they're 100% terrestrial. Awesome. I have I have two species of. They're I'm not sure if they're considered varicosis or shinorum, but I got them from two different sources. The one is like they like it 100% aquatic, and the other one really prefers a terrestrial. Okay. So I think they might be different localities. So I'm keeping them separate. Um, and then this year I'm experimenting with keeping some crocodus terrestrial. I've always just kept them aquatic in the past, but um, some European, a lot of a lot of European consist keepers, I think, do raise them on land. Um, so I'm trying that out this year as well. And then aside uh, from the marble newts, um, what else do I have on land? I have some warty newts that, I, you know, they just don't like to go aquatic um, until they're a little bit older. And then the Lau, the, the louse warty newts, they're also, they also pretty much some, I've seen some people lately that they have got them to stay aquatic uh, at morphing, but I haven't felt comfortable doing that yet. So I'm giving those a terrestrial phase as well. I think that's pretty much it. That's very interesting. Um, the the Nerugus crocatus, uh, we're mm -hmm. actually raising uh, a group of them over here. Person, but the store that I'm working at, we're raising them terrestrially. Okay. Uh, now, we haven't gone to where they've needed to go into the aquatic stage yet, so I don't know if maybe that defers at that point, uh, whether they have to go back. But we're, the plan or the hope is to keep them terrestrial as long as possible, and so far it's going pretty well. How old are they? Uh they would be over a year old at this point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be interested to see how that works out. Yeah. I know a yeah. lot of the European keepers definitely tend to keep things biphasically. Um, yeah. But yeah, we're not as good about that over here. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, that's, that's, that's very interesting. If you were to give new um, car date keepers advice, new, new and salamander keepers uh, advice, what would it be? To be successful at keeping any new or salamander, it really comes down to getting that husbandry right. So I always tell people, you want to keep something that you can easily provide proper conditions for. So if you have a house that doesn't have central air, I'm um, going to guess 90 degrees in the summer. Hopefully not, but, you know, it could <laughs> yeah. if you can't, if you don't have a cool room in your house, like I would say pretty much just don't keep that species. Like it's not, it's not practical, you know. I mean, you can get into, I guess, a cooler or a chiller or something like that. But if you have if you have a really hard time providing the right conditions, um, I say it's probably not. You're probably getting off to the wrong start. So, so what you're saying is, ice bottles every day is not is not convenient. Yeah, I mean, if the power goes out, <laughs> that, uh, you can do it. But I mean, overall, you're just going to kind of probably burn yourself out, and you know, the condition of the animal is probably going to suffer. Um, so yeah, keep animals that you can best accommodate. Um, their 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 physical needs their um yeah the animal's needs so on top yeah. of that too um think about how long you want to keep this animal for caudates can live a very long time i still get people that come by the table and say oh is that a fire belly newt i used to have one uh, and lived for about 30 years so wow. they can be very long lived. Um, so similar, similarly, like if you're getting like a pet tortoise or something like that, a lot of these animals can live a very long time. So even though they're small, um, think about that. That's going to be in your family for a long time. So it's going to need that care. And ultimately, you know, it's, uh, once you get it down, it's not, you know, backbreaking labor or anything, <laughs> but you know, it's just something you want to be mindful of. Um, so yeah, if you can provide the proper conditions for the animal, um, that's, that's probably, I guess, number one is making sure you can do that. And then just read, read, read as much information as you can on just the, just the overall care for the animal. There's, there's a lot more information on the, uh, the internet um, than there was probably when I got started. Um, I remember spending a lot of hours on Codata.org. Uh, they have a forum on there with you know people just answering questions or asking questions. Um, so odds are... Um, someone's probably encountered a situation that you have and they there's probably that information's on there they also have um, basically care sheets for a bunch of different species that's all on there um, so yeah just really do the research on what that animal needs um, before getting one and then setting up before you just you know I, I never encourage anyone to impulsively buy something um, you know they while they are I do say they are hardy animals you know you can kill one in 
no time flat, you know, if you're not prepared for it. So um, definitely do your Don't homework, by, get set up. Uh, but yeah, they're very rewarding. I, I'm a huge, like, I love seeing like the seasonal changes, like the crested newts, you know, seeing them go from just the plain brown newt to having, you know, that massive dragon crest, you know, it's, you know, I don't think I'll ever get tired of seeing that. Um, and then the process too, of like seeing the eggs and the larva develop. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a very rewarding experience overall. And then now that there's so many different species out there too, that are available, you know, the, you know, the color range is, you know, almost anything, you know, if you want something bright orange, bright yellow, pink, yeah. <laughs> black and white, you know, hundred percent, something for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, if you so can all provide in all, the proper, no, sorry, proper, go ahead. if you can provide, as long as you can provide the proper care for it. Yeah, I agree. So all in all, would you recommend them as a good, um, as a good pet? Should more people be considering them? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I get, agree. Get a caudate. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. I 100% agree. Underrated. Yeah. Definitely underrated. Yeah. I've only been keeping them for, uh, I've been working with axolotls uh, for, for a couple of years, but I've only been keeping the other species that I have for about a year now. And I cannot believe I did not get into them sooner. I cannot recommend them enough. Get caudates, guys. They're a lot of fun. Oh, absolutely. 100% would recommend. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Well, Josiah, thank you very, very, very much for coming on and doing this. Absolutely. Um, we got to do it again. Uh, thank you. No problem at all. Uh, we got to do it again just, just because we got to do more Newton salamander talks, but we also got to do it again with your brother and get the <laughs> whole uh, serpents and salamanders uh, all, all together. Um, sure. But yeah, I, I already just just sort of said serpents and salamanders, but for, for the people that don't like to listen, <laughs> where, where, where can everybody find you? Uh, that's a good question. So we're most most active on Instagram and Facebook, um, just posting stuff from our day to day, you know, meanderings in the newt and snake room. Uh, we post, you know, available animals on Morph Market, uh, on a classifieds occasionally. Uh, we do have a website, but it's a lot of work to maintain, and it's usually it sells out so fast it's kind of not worth keeping it updated. So. Uh, yeah, if you want to get in contact with us, yeah, you know, DM us on Facebook or Instagram, you know, we love, we love talking to people about it and answering questions, you know, anyone might have, um, about the animals we keep, you know, we're, we love talking about it and sharing about it. So I'll have the links to the Instagram and the Facebook in the show notes, go check them out. Give these guys a follow. They're doing some awesome stuff. Um, I really, really enjoy going through your Instagram and, and um, not that I, I, I love the snakes too, but I really, really enjoy seeing all the, uh, all the salamanders and the newts. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you very much. Go give serpents and salamanders a follow guys, uh, guys, hopefully you'll see them on here very, very soon. Um, I am Daffy's reptiles on all social media platforms. Daffy's round table for the podcast. Thank you for listening. Go buy an amphibian <laughs> and see you guys next time.